All right, so if you guys were at church last week, Sunday, I shared, as uh, Shanda was saying, I shared that um, I started a 21 day of prayer last week, Sunday. And I, I, I want to warn you now, it's two things I'm warning you now. I had a great week in prayer. I feel renewed. I feel strengthened. And, and I have a little um, sermon mantra I got when I prepare messages. It, it says the recipe for sermon. It says, study yourself full, think yourself clear, pray yourself hot, and let yourself go. So if I'm, if I'm preaching and I'm acting all weird and, and, and Holy Spirit is coming all over the place, blame it on, on, on the prayer and everything. But I just want to warn you guys in advance that I feel good. Um, I really feel, um, you know, just encouraged right now. And, I, and I, my prayer for, for you today is that this message of prayer that we're talking about will um, improve your prayer life. It will make you understand the power of prayer. It will make you understand that God wants to hear from you. God cares for you. And there's nothing too big or nothing too small that he can't take care of. Prayer is a very important part of our, our, of our faith life. It's the way we communicate with God. Imagine a world, billions of people in here, no one talked. No communication. It, it would be reckless. It would be crazy. I mean, we live in a house with a spouse, so just imagine when no one's talking in the house. That's, that's an uncomfortable feeling. When everybody's mad at each other, no one's talking. That's an uncomfortable feeling right there. So imagine, I mean, you have to have a proper communication um, way, uh, in corresponding with God. That's, that's how we talk to him. That's how we have a relationship with him. So um, let's go, Mar. You ready? All the way down. So this message is called Connected Through Prayer. And the reason I'm calling it Connected Through Prayer is because when I think about technology, we're all connected. We're all on our phones. We're all on the computer. You know, my son don't have a phone, but boy, he's always on that game. And when he turn off that game, then he's on his tablet. When he turn off that tablet, then he's on his iPod. He always has to be connected to something, you know? And the truth of the matter is that's, that's the generation we live in. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying that if we can be so connected to social media, don't you think it's the same thing? We need to be connected in our faith with God. And, and what surprises me so much about technology, my grandmother here, anytime I go over her house and I'm on the phone and she's talking to me, she's like, well, I'm not gonna talk to you if you're on the phone. So I, like, I gotta put the phone down. So we're always connected, right? But think about this. If, if we live, we, if we, what really surprises me about technology so much is that when we watch the social media or watch the news or the, whatever is happening, it's, it's a lot of great things, but it's also a lot of bad things too. And when you think about that is, those are the things that should be catapulting you to even want to pray more because man, some craziness is happening. Some real foolishness is happening out there. And when, we're con when we are observing all of this, we're connected so much to that, we gotta be careful that it just, we just kind of blend in with it and it just becomes normal. But, but in, in what happens and when we spend so much time on technology, it takes away our time from God, you know? I mean, I'm not a social media guy. I mean, I know my phone, but praise God for Amazon. Hey, hey, praise the Lord for Amazon, right? So, so um, I'm gonna share this passage with you. And, um, but what I want you to understand, the reason I'm bringing this up is because God wants to do so many amazing things in your life. He has a big purpose for you. He wants to use you to change your inner circle, your friends, your family, your co-workers, to change a nation. But we have to stay connected with God. And we stay connected with God through prayer. Because when we're on social media, if we put it down one minute, we feel like we're out of breath. We feel like we're missing something. We gotta pick it up quick time and check. It's just something addictive about that, the social media network. Well, you know, particularly for the younger generation, and a lot of us, but we gotta stay connected. But my prayer is that we get that urge, we get that desire where we want it. We, we need to be in God's presence. We need to be connected to God. Guys, there's sometimes um, when I'm at work and I don't know, it's just something in the inside. It, maybe like, because you know, maybe I've been like having a rough day, busy day, a lot going on. And it's like, man, I need to pull away, man. I just get that urge where I need to pull away. And, and I work him on a bay and sometimes I just go out there by the um, ocean um, to the back. And it just gives me so much peace just to, relax and just pray to God and say, Lord, you know, I need help in this. I need you in this and stuff like that. And I just feel a whole lot better. I need to be connected. So um, 
I'm going to share this passage with you. It's on John chapter 15. And I'm reading from the NLT version. And it's Jesus. And he talks about the true vine. He says, um, I am the true grapevine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. So they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So I shared earlier that God created us to do great things, awesome things, big things in our life God wants us to do. But in this passage, he's saying, you can't do nothing without me. You have to be connected. You have to be. And so, so what he shared by this is, he's saying that every tree must bear fruit. So if you're not bearing fruit, that means you, you can't do anything. We're, we're created to bear good fruits, to do good works for the Father. But we have to be um, connected to God in order for him to strengthen us, in order for him to encourage us, in order for him to download stuff in us. And in order for us, vice versa, we need to release things to God. And we can only do that through prayer. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is we can't, the first thing is we have to have a pray first mentality. Pray first. Listen to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. He says, very early in the morning, the writer of Mark actually, very early in the morning. So if that's very early in the morning, that's telling you that Jesus made first priority that while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went, to, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. It's something about putting God first where God acts. He loves when we put him first. Because first, when we communicate, when we put side, um, things aside for God and put it in its rightful place, it's something that com um, communicates that, God, you are first. God, I value you. God, I love you. God, I need you. God, I, I, I'm, I'm depending on you. And in, in the Bible, it always talked about the first fruits or the first gifts. It was something about the first that God always blessed the first. Anytime you put God first, trust me, he's going to show up. Like I told you guys, so this week here, um, I've been doing the 21 day of um, um, prayer. And I've been getting up 6 o'clock every morning. So for some of you, that's easy, but I'm not a morning person. I'm a night owl, but I'm not a morning person. So I've been getting up 6 o'clock every morning. I'm going to tell you my week has been great my workload has been down I mean it, it hasn't been crazy I mean I'm going in people's office and they're like Richard why are you so joyful and I'm like I don't know I just feel good you know and I'm telling you that I feel that it's contributing part of it's, it's um, because of setting that time setting that morning and putting God first I feel that he just makes the rest of your day he makes the rest of your day think about it most of us in who's been in relationships you didn't date nobody because they put you last. You dated them because they put you first. They, put, they called you early in the morning. Hey, I just want you to have a good day today. They sent you flowers. You know, they opened the car door for you. Whatever it was because they put you first. And it made you feel special, right? And I'm telling you guys, it's something about when you put God first. And I'm not talking about just in the morning. I'm talking about before you um, send that email, and you wait till I get them. No, no, pray for us. Pray for us. Because you know you're going to say something you're going to regret, Lord. Um, um, before you make that decision, pray for us. Before you um, make that phone call, you just wait till I get them on the phone. Pray for us. Pray for us. Because it is something that when you put it in God's hand, he's going to either bless it or he's going to speak to you and say, hey, don't do that. He's going to change your mind or, or send you a new perspective. And I give you a, um, a testimony on that. My wife, um, she bought a new car last year. And before we even um, you know, went away to buy the car, we went to Florida and bought, um, bought it. And we prayed about it. Say, Lord, you know, we just want your blessing on this. We want, we want you to find the right car. We don't want no lemon. We want a, um, a, a car with all the features that we want. We just want all of this because you know why? Because I've screwed up a lot of times. I've wasted money a lot of times. I've made some bad decisions all the time. So Lord, we're putting you first. So we did that leading up to going. And when we got to Miami, you know, we, we, um, we had about four, three or four cars that we all had set up that we wanted. So, you know, we went to visit the first one. Um, we really wanted that one. 
But for some reason, the owner, we couldn't get a hold of the owner who had the keys. So I don't know, that didn't work out. We went and looked for two other cars. Uh, they were okay, they were basic. So we were in the mall now, um, trying to make a decision what we gonna do. We went, get some, went to get something to eat. And she, you know we're talking like, you know, which one you like or whatever. Oh, and actually, sorry. The first day we went and looked for one other car and the car wasn't even, the dealer couldn't find the car because we saw it online. We went to the dealer and they're like, yeah, come on, let's, let's go and find it. And they're looking around, they couldn't find the car. I'm like, okay, well, I guess that wasn't meant to be. So we, um, we're in the mall, we're praying and we boil down to one car. It was a basic car, didn't really have all the features we wanted, you know, but okay. So we decided we we're gonna go. So we're walking out to go now, to go to the dealer and it's pouring rain in. So I didn't think nothing about it. I just thought, okay, well, let's just wait till the rain. Then the guy that we went and looked for the first car, who he couldn't find the car, he calls and say, hey, the car's here now. Um, we was getting service and stuff like that, but it's here now, come on. I say, okay, um, let's go and check this one out. And that car had all the features we wanted. It was immaculate, it was clean, no dents, nothing. It had all the features and Teresa fell in love with it right away. And that car today, I mean, if you guys see it, it's a beauty. And it was within our budget and it was exactly what we asked for. Why? Because we put God first. He closed the doors. He made that rain come down to not go for that other car. He sent that text message right in, right in um, time from the dealer to come and visit that car. All because I feel, in my opinion, because we put God first and we put it in his hands in prayer. And I give you another upside to that. A um, couple of years ago, um, I have some apartments that I built. And this, I think this was before I was a believer. And you know, it's two little studio apartments on my mother property and I got a loan for them but I rushed in that. I didn't give it much thought. I thought I can do this on my own. I thought I know what I was doing. And, and half, not halfway, but almost close to the end, it ran out of money. I didn't know what I was gonna do. Um, I couldn't finish the apartments. I was stressed and out. I was worried. I didn't know what was gonna happen. And, and, and what I'm trying to illustrate to you is, I did something with, with even consulting with God without even thinking about it. I thought I can deal with it. I thought I can handle it. And obviously I couldn't because I almost didn't get to finish them, but praise be to God that I got them finished, and thank God that I actually paid off the loan this year, amen? amen? So, I just wanted to highlight to you the difference of putting God first. You have to put God first, because whatever you put first, He's gonna bless it. He's gonna bless it, right? And I actually have, um, I actually, me and my wife, we, we did a, a, a teaching with the youth a couple of years ago, and we did um, the Lord's Prayer. We taught them what the, uh, about the Lord's Prayer and about praying. And actually the church that I'm following the 21 day um, prayer with, they came up with these um, little bracelets and it's called Pray First. And he, um, the pastor, you know, he, he, won't, he gives them out in the congregation for free and, and he encourages people, you know, just take a look when you go in that meeting, pray first. You know, before you make that decision, just pray first. And I actually have some, so you guys can walk here today if you want. You can get these free, no charge, you know. Um, yeah, they're right there in the back if you, if you want to pray first. Amen. All right, the next one that we're going to be talking about is, come on, Mar, let's go, follow me, is casting your cares. Guys, we all have worries in life. We all have cares in life. We all have stresses in life. We all have pain in life, right? But the problem is, is that God never created us to worry so much. God never created us to, to, to be stressed out so much, right? Or another way to say it is God never created us to um, carry our cares. And he never created us to, um, burden, um, to shoulder our burdens. But we do that so much. And, and I understand, I do it too. Because life is so demanding, life is so challenging, is that we, we end up doing these things. But um, help me out, Amar. So First Peter... Um, well, actually, you went too far, sorry. First Peter 5, verse 7 says, Give your worries and cares to God because He cares for you. Give your worries and your cares to God for He cares for you. The NIV version to that says, cast your cares. So you know in the Bible days, it was more of a um, um, fisher, fisherman and our cultural society. So the, the terminology of um, casting was the nets that they had to catch fish. They would cast out their nets. And what God is saying is, you know, sometimes we think like, oh, I don't want to burden God, or I got too much worries, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, you know, stress him out, you can't, you can't stress out God. But we feel like, you know, I don't want to give, and God is actually saying, hey, throw it, give it all to me. Everything that you're worried about, everything that you're going through, just, 
just give me everything. He's not saying, okay, just give me one at a time. I can only handle one, one at a time. Give me one. No, he's saying, chaos. Throw it. Come on. Throw it onto him, man. Give him everything that you're going through, everything that is burdening you, everything. He said, cast your cares on to God because he cares for you. Uh, Matthew 11, verse 28, verse 30 says, um, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and my and the burden I give you is light. So in the Bible again, our, our, our cultural background, a yoke was, maybe you guys seen them um, on TV or maybe, I don't know, been to a farm, but a yoke is usually, they would have two bulls and they would have these um, things that they would put over them to plow the land. So the bulls would pull it to plow the land, but they were very heavy. So imagine now, you put a, um, one of those yokes that a bull, obviously an oxen, very big and strong, you put that on hu a human being. That's unbearable. You wouldn't be able to manage that, right? And God never created us to carry so much weight. That's why he says, my yoke is easy to bear and my burden is light. Just, just give it to God. Cast your cares, whatever you're going through. The best illustration I could have think about on this is that, you know, I travel a lot. Um, actually, um, Teresa, I mean, we own American Airlines, but we just let other people fly because they keep down the cost, you know. But um, we travel a lot, and, and if you're from the islands, you know, um, you know, you go up with one bag, but you come back with like four, <laughs> four bags, you know. And I'm just thinking, going through the airport, especially like when you're running late, you're running late, and you're running with these bags. It's heavy, you're sweating, you're tired, and you're running, you know, the cutoff time soon happens and you're running to the checkout counter, and then you get in the line, and then you hand the bags. And then the attendant says, oh, your bag is overweight, and then you throw everything on the ground and you're trying to stuff bag um, things from one another because it's over, um, over, uh, overweight. But when you finally release those bags, um, those bags over and they go into the carousel and stuff, it's like, whew, so much weight is lifted. And that's what it means. That's what it means when God is saying, bring it to me. Come on. I don't want you to carry all of this. I don't want you to carry all that hurt and pain. Just give it to me and I will take care of it. The next one, um, oh, sorry. Now these scriptures here, some other scriptures about um, casting your cares. Um, Proverbs 12 verse 25 says, worry, we where, um, sorry, worry weighs a person down. Pro um, Psalms 55 22 says, there we go again. Cast your cares onto the Lord, and he will su sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. And in Philippians 4, verse um, 6 to 7 says, Don't worry about anything, but instead, instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need, and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You know, before I was a Christian, I would always hear my mother say that, because um, she's a nurse, she would always say that um, everyone that comes to the hospital, they just stressed out, they just worried. And, and when I really looked into it, guys, you, do you know that um, a lot of hospital visits are stress-related? A lot of hospital visits are stress-related. Because, listen, listen to what um, Paul says in our last verse. He says, he says, his peace will guide your hearts and minds as you live in Christ. When you stressed out, when you got a lot in your mind, you have those headaches. And when you burden and you just got so much worry and just you get um, anxiety inside, it just weighs you down. And God is saying, um, Paul is saying in this, he says, listen, don't worry about anything, but instead, listen, take it to God in prayer. And then when that happens, the peace of God who transcends all understanding will rest upon you, your heart and your mind. Those are the two areas that are linked and are affected when we are stressed out too much and we carry too much weight. So guys, release it, release it. Um, the next one uh, is God knows your desires. God knows your desires. I think um, especially as maybe younger Christians, a lot of them think that you know God wants to take away my pleasure, I can't have fun, I can't do this, what about my dreams, what about things I wanted to do? God is not against you having fun. God, or God is not against you, um, I, I should say. God is not against your happiness, I should say, right? We all, you know, come on, let's be honest. We all want this and, you know, there are certain things we would like to do and places we'd like to go and things we'd like to have. And God is not against that. 
God is not. Listen to what um, Psalms chapter 20 verse 4 says. It says, may he give you the desire of your heart and make all of your plans succeed. Psalms 37 verse 4 says, take the light in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I remember um, I was a couple of years ago, I was on staff at um, a local church and I was in the finance industry before that and I took a 50% pay cut to go and work in ministry as a, as a youth, um, youth minister. And praise to be to God, you know, he met every need, you know. Um, it was a big cut, but you know, our bills were paid, food was on the table, clothes were on our back, but we did have to make some cuts. And I remember one time, you know, <clears throat> I'm gonna be honest, I mean, I was like almost to tears because I, I couldn't get to like the simplest thing, like take my kids to the movie that often. You know, or, or take my family out to a nice dinner. I'm like, God, I just, I just want to take my family out to a movie. I just want to take my family out to dinner. You think that's something that God wouldn't bless? That's a desire. You think that he's against me wanting to do nice things with my family? No, he's not against that. He wants you to have happiness. Um, um, James chapter 4 says, you desire, but do not have. So you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. And he just says this, he says you do not have because you do not ask God. All we gotta do is ask God. Guys, whatever your heart desire, whatever you, you would like, it, I mean, if it's according to God's will, I mean, I'm not saying that you can say, Lord, kill my neighbor's dog and he gonna answer that. No, he's not gonna answer that prayer. Um, but you know what I mean, right? There's desire, listen, and first of all, that most likely that desire you have is from God. And I'm telling you that, if you say to God, Lord, this is what I'd like. This is what I'd like to do. I believe he would honor that. He would honor that. So God knows your desires, and he says, ask. Um, Amar, there's a next slide. This um, guy, Mark Battison, he wrote a book called The Prayer Maker. He said, the greatest tragedy in life is the prayers that go unanswered because they go unasked. Trust me. There's so much God that want, God wants to do. You just need to ask. You just need to pray about it. And I'm just, uh, this is my prayer is that when you leave here today, you would cultivate a healthy communication with God on a daily basis in praying. Yeah? Um, the next one now is um, prayer changes everything. Um, you know, just think about it. Some of us in, our, in church right now, we wish that so-and-so was here with us. Man, I wish my son would just come to church. Man, I just wish my husband would come to church with me. Man, I just wish my boss would, would acknowledge me. I just wish that, you know, um, the government would change this policy or whatever it is. It's so many things that we would like to change. And that's where I was talking about. Now, God has created us for purpose and created us to do great things for him. And there's so much things we want to do. But the problem is, the frustrating part is, is that we want control. We want to do it. We want to do it. And, and it doesn't work like that, you know? Um, this same um, writer that wrote, he said, um, he said we can, have a, we can either have faith or we can have control, but we can't have both. And what happens is, is that I want you to realize that when you put things in God's hands, he's, he can move on your behalf. L listen to what um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 4 says. It says, I urge you, Come on, I urge you. When somebody urge you, they're strongly su suggesting that you do it. I urge you. There it goes again. First, first of all, pray for all people. Who's all people? Your enemies, your neighbors, that MLA you didn't vote for. Pray for every, pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf. You know why God is asking to help them and intercede on their behalf? There's a lot of people in the world doing all kinds of crazies, craziness, but the truth of the matter is they don't know. They don't know what they're doing because the Bible says that the um, prince of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers that they can't see. And, and we say, the reason I say that prayer changes everything, because we want to see our society change. We want to see this nation change. We want to see people change. But it only comes by praying for them. Listen to what it says. And give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all of the, all in who is in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by God, God, godliness and dignity this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth um, 
You might say, I'm not praying for my enemies. I can't do that. But it has a condition. It says, this is good and it pleases God. And if we're going to call ourselves believers, don't we want to do what pleases God and what's good? That means we have to pray for all people. And the reason why I think that this, this um, passage is so significant about changing everything is because when we stand in, a, in our nation and we, we think that you know, change is going to come by government policy and we think that change is, change is going to come by the amount of money that's thrown out there, uh, that, that's far from it. Change comes when a person comes in, in encounter with God and when God can change that person's heart and he can change their motives and then that person becomes in a position of influence and now that because they're a believer, they're, they have now biblical thoughts and, 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 uh, and the right motives and, and the right morals that they can now make sound decisions based on God, the principles. But the truth of the matter, a lot of times our society is in ruins. And I don't know just came out, I don't know worldwide, is because we have ungodly people in positions of power. And that is what it makes a society decay. But when you start praying from your children from young and they get to a place of influence, they're going to be there with God. When you pray for your neighbor and you pray for different people all around you, you're praying for them to have that encounter with God. Why? Because Paul said that it is God, God who wants everyone to be saved and come to the understanding of truth. That should be a prayer for all of us, that our neighbors and our co-workers and our unsaved family member comes to a knowledge of truth. And that's when we're going to see change. You're not going to change people by um, forcing them. You're not going to... Um, um, create change by, by telling people you're going to hell. You're not going to get change by um, dragging someone to church. You're going to um, really get change by praying for that person and being an example to them. I heard um, many of you guys may have remember CJ. CJ was someone who um, was a part of our um, worship, worship team, but he's actually, um, I think he's a missionary now. He's in um, part of YWAM or something like that now, right? Um, but he shared with me some time ago, um, probably a year or two ago, which I, I didn't really think about it that way. He said, do you realize that every person who has come to Christ is as a result of someone praying for them? And my mom can tell you right here, when I was at the worst of my worst, she said, oh boy, I want to pray for you. And I stand here today. Right? Amen? Yeah. So prayer changes everything and changes everyone. Remember prayer. You're not going to fuss them out. You can't cuss them out. You have to pray them out. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right, the next one is, come on, Amar, follow me. The next one is, um, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. A lot of us, listen, I don't be honest. That's how I am sometimes. I feel like giving up after the first time, you know. My Lord, you're not answering my prayer lot, um, quick enough, you know. Um, or sometimes we just feel like, I don't know, it's like it's too big for God or something. I mean, it's like we know better, but it's like inside is a different thing. It's like, you know, ah, Lord, I pray for this. But it's like we don't really put a lot of strength. We don't put a lot of um, effort in it. We don't pray um, continually. And the word, the word cease means to like, like stop, like come to an end. But the Bible is saying is pray without ceasing. Don't stop. Don't give up. And I think a lot of us have a habit of praying once or twice and that's it. But we have to have uh, what, whatever your eyes is set on, whatever God has put on your heart. Listen, continue praying that until until that comes to fruition. Listen to what um, Luke chapter 18, verse 1 8 to say. It talks about the story of the persistent widow. It says, Jesus told a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and never quit. He said, There was once a judge in some city who never a judge in some city who never gave God a thought and cared nothing for people. A widow in that city kept after him. My rights are being violated. Protect me. He never gave her the time of day. But after this went on and he said to himself, I care nothing about what God thinks, even less what people think. But because this widow won't quit badgering me, I'd, I'd better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her pounding. Then the master said, do you hear? The master's referring to Jesus now. Do you hear what that judge, corrupt as he is, is saying? So whatever makes you think God won't step in and work, sorry, what makes you think that God won't step in and work justice for his chosen people who continue to cry out for help? 
Won't he stick up for them? I assure you he will. He will not drag his feet. But how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on earth when he returns? <clears throat> Guys, prayer, we have to be consistent with it. We have to not give up. You know, it's so funny that, you know, a lot of us, you know, we've been to university so, so much and it's hard. And we, we sometimes we go to school, we feel like giving up, but our parents say, no, you can't give up, keep going, keep going. It has to be the same way in our faith, you know. We, when there's something on our heart that we want to pray about, we have to keep pressing in. We have to believe God that He's going to answer it. We have to believe God that, you know, He's going to see us through. But I'm not going to give up because, you know what? The more I knock on God's door, the more I tell Him, the Lord, I need you to show up in this area, He's going to show up. And I'm going to show you a passage that um, actually shows evidence to that. But I just want to share a story with you um, <clears throat> about, so, um, about two years ago, so like I shared earlier that I had two little studio apartments on my mom's property I built. And so I, um, I, had, I, I had my mortgage, I had the loan for those um, apartments, and I had another personal loan that we did um, renovations for. But I would say about two year, up to two years ago or so, I was anticipating when these other two loans would get paid off, the, the um, renovation loan and the, the apartment loan. So I was like, yeah. I can't wait till I get these paid up, you know, get freed up with some cash and stuff like that, have more financial flexibility. So I was excited about that and I was praying. I'm like, Lord, um, when I pay these off, I don't want to go back in debt, Lord. I don't want to, I don't want to um, spend money foolishly like I've done in the past. I want to be more financially responsible. And I was praying that. And then closer to the, when the loans are about to pay off, I would say maybe about last year sometimes, uh, uh, I, I would say to God, Lord, I need a truck, but I don't, I don't really want to get a loan. I don't want to go back and get a loan again, but my truck was giving me trouble. And, um, you know, um, it was just getting old and stuff. And I'm like, Lord, uh, anyway, I went, um, I got the two loans paid off and I went to the bank and I, and I um, found out how much I can get to buy a new truck and stuff. And I was going to lean that way, but that's not what I really wanted. But like I said, I was praying for like two years before that. Like, Lord, free me up. I don't want to be in debt. I want to be free, Lord. And, and just, you know, when I was getting ready to, um, what, not say sign the dotted line, but you know, put things into place to get this truck, you know. Um, someone said to me, what are you gonna do that for? Just wait, just wait. And someone blessed me with some funds to buy a truck, cash. Praise the Lord, right? Persistent prayer, guys. Persistent prayer. Like I said, I prayed that prayer two years ago, Lord. I don't want to go in debt. Free me up. I don't want another loan. And I, I prayed that consistently. I was all, now I never say I prayed every day, but I was praying that often. You know, every, you know, once a week, twice a week. Lord, free me up. Free me up. But listen, listen to this passage. Um, this is in Daniel chapter ten. If you guys know Daniel, um, Daniel was a prophet in the Old Testament. Um, he was living in a foreign land in Babylon, and Daniel was living in a culture that wanted him to to um, adapt to their culture. But Daniel was a man that was strong in his convictions. He, he, he prayed to God regularly. He um, stood for what God um, meant in his life. And many of you guys know the story of um, Shadrach, Meshach, and um, Abednego, when they wouldn't do what the king told them to do. So he said, okay, put them in the fire. And God was in the, Jesus was in the fire with them and they didn't burn. And the king was amazed, wow. Um, that, you know, and that third, that fourth person that was in there with them was actually Jesus. Um, and yeah, so, Daniel had a rough time in that time, and, and there came another point in his life where he had a vision. Daniel had a vision, and he was troubled by the vision, because the vision, part of the vision, um, talked about wars and the um, hardship for the land and stuff like that, and it troubled him. So he decided he was going to do a 21-day prayer and fasting. And he was fasting um, and praying for, you know, the Bible says three weeks, 21 days. and. I guess midway through, maybe, I don't know, I, I don't remember what the Bible says exactly, but midway through somewhere, um, an angel appeared to him. And listen to what um, Daniel 10, verse 12, 13 says. It says, then he said, this is the angel, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and, and to um, humble yourself before God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the um, archangels, came to help me. 
And I left him there with the spirit of prince of the kingdom of Persia. So actually, sorry, correct myself. This is day 21 now of his prayer and fasting. An angel came to Daniel and said, hey, your, your prayer was answered from day one. But there were things that was holding me back from bringing that prayer to you. But imagine if Daniel had probably given up on that first day. Imagine how many of our prayers we end up hindering because we decide, Lord, you wait, you're taking too long. You know what? I'm going to go and do this thing. I'm going to take matters in my own hands. I feel that we hinder a lot of our prayers because we won't just allow God to move. We won't just work, wait patiently for God instead of just being consistent, being consistent. Oh, I got another one for you. The same Mark Baddison. And the reason I'm quoting him so much because he read, he had a book that I read. He says, too often we pray ASAP prayers as soon as, as soon as possible. Instead, we need to pray ALAP prayers as long as it takes. Lord, as long as it takes. Lord, I'm going to keep trusting you. I'm going to keep pressing into you. So, guys, I'm wrapping up here now. Um, but I want you to understand that I'm, this isn't everything about prayer. I'm just giving you a few things that I feel that would help you to understand that God cares for you. God knows your desires. You have the authority to change things as a believer and that to pray without ceasing don't give up because a lot of us you know we'll have me you know my, my family can tell you here i've been praying not for 21 days per se what's going to happen on day 22 i don't want to stop i want to keep praying i want to keep getting up early in the morning i want to keep that posture of prayer so my my prayer for you is that you won't give up that you would go home feeling encouraged that god wants to hear from me he wants to carry my burdens because he cares for me. He, he knows my desires. He's not against me having, um, having happiness. He wants to give me the um, happiness. So I'm going to end um, on this note. So one of the, um, so the church we're following, they, they put up little, so six o'clock every morning, um, you watch um, their prayer service live. So they give you a word of encouragement and um, one song of worship and then like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you, you pray and then they come back and close. All of this is on live feed. So one of, one of the days, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, I can't remember, one of the um, pa um, pastors at the place spoke. And I found it so, so insightful. He said, um, he said, listen to Matthew 18, 19. It says, this is Jesus. I also tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. And he gave, this, he gave this illustration of his daughter. He, he was talking about they don't allow their kids to sleep out, you know. So they went to this um, school function with their um, daughter. And I guess she had it all lined out. She comes and says, Daddy, Daddy, can so-and-so sleep over? And he's like, you know, sweetie, you know the rule, you know. We, we, we don't allow um, anyone to sleep over. And then the little girl comes and say, Mr. So-and-so, um, you know, can I sleep over with you, um, with so-and-so? Um, and -so? and uh, he's like, um, you know, we don't, we don't really um, allow, you know, our daughter to sleep over. And then the parents of the little girl comes and say, yeah, it's okay, she can sleep over, you know. And the point he was illustrating is when people come together in agreement, she had already um, set her mind in a range that if enough people come in agreement with me, my dad is going to have to say yes. And that was so insightful, right? So it's something, guys, when we come together, when we come together in prayer. Now, God hears us when we pray one-on-one. -on -one. But he says, when two or more of you come together on something, listen, that's powerful, right? And then he shared this other part. You know, this is for Lucas, people who like to work out, right? He shared this other part. He said, you know, he went to the gym one time. And, you know, if you've been to the gym or you see people, how they work out, the guys, oh, sorry, Sorry, I didn't mean to be feminine. Um, women too, women too. But when you're when they're lifting weights, right? They normally have a um, what's it called? Um, spot me. They have they normally have someone there to help them. You know that make sure they don't drop the weight on them if it gets too heavy. So he saw other people. He went there and he saw other guys. You know they had their partners helping them out. But he said, Nah, I got this, man. I got this. So he went and he's doing his twenty um, um, lifts and he's like, ah. Oh, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And he said when he gets like the 17, and he gets the 18, and he's like, when he's down to 19, he, he, he couldn't lift it anymore, and he's like, oh, I hope somebody comes and help me, and someone say, I got you, man, I got you. And, he, and um, 
the guy came and said, I got you. And he helped him up, right? And he said, come on, you can do another one. He says, one more. And he's like, okay, 21. He said, come on, you can do it, man. 22. And then another guy comes and says, yeah, man, come on, you can do this. And the, the, the strength that he didn't know he had, he ended up having. And the point he was making was is that sometimes we are too prideful to ask for help. We're too prideful to ask for someone to pray with me. We're too prideful to say, man, I need you to support me on this one, man. I need you to lift me up on this one. And I'm going to close with this. Um, Tamisha has been so kind. Um, she created a little prayer box. And I, I don't want you to leave here today. We got some cards in the back. You don't have to put your name. It's anonymous. Whatever cares you have, whatever troubles you, whatever you need prayer on, I want to encourage you. Come on, support me. Don't, don't get too prideful. You know, we're two or more. When two people come in agreement, He's gonna come there and he's gonna answer that prayer. So before you leave here today, listen, I want you to write a card. You don't have to put your name and just drop it in this box. And this is what I'm saying. Over the next 20, well, not 21, um, the remainder of days I have left for prayer, me and my family, we're gonna commit, we're gonna pray over those cards. In addition to that, I spoke to Felix yesterday and I felt led to um, corporate prayer. So starting Saturday, the next two Saturdays, we're gonna open up Journey and we're going to do corporate prayer together, and you're more than welcome to come. And we're going to pray for this nation. We're going to pray for our, um, you know, our leaders, Felix and Dorothy. We're going to pray for our, um, our leaders. We're going to pray for this church. We're going to pray for unsaved people, and we're going to pray over these cards. And this is the only thing I ask of you. This is the only thing I ask. If you get a breakthrough, you got to share it. you got to share what God has done in your life. you got to come up here, and you got to share that testimony. Amen? Is that our agreement?